evening. Thanks for tuning in to our online discussion of the book of Matthew. Uh, for the last several weeks, we've been going through um, this wonderful text um, from God's Word, trying to understand um, the purpose of this inspired book. Um, and ultimately, what we've been emphasizing week after week is that it is a book designed to show us that Jesus is the promised Messiah, specifically to the Jewish people. But what we're trying to do in this, while keeping that context in mind, we're trying to make practical application to ourselves through this study. So let me encourage you that have tuned in to follow along in your Bibles, open them up to the book of Matthew, and let me remind you that as this is being broadcasted now, you can access it anytime on our Facebook page and YouTube. It'll also be replayed on Wednesday, and then you'll have an opportunity at 7 o'clock on Wednesday to log in and participate in our Zoom discussion group where we can talk about what we've been studying in person. I know there was some confusion before about how to log in. Uh, feel free to email any of us, message one of us, and we'll get you that login information. We don't want anyone to feel left out. So we are in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we've transitioned from, you know, the early biography of Jesus, you know, and his birth and his early ministry to, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. And now we're in the, some sections that show a lot of miracles and show a lot of emphasis on the authority of Jesus. Um, anything you guys want to bring up, maybe by way of review before we get into this section in chapter 10 that maybe we need to emphasize? I, I think we, we saw at the end of last week um, when he calls his apostles, mm -hmm. um, and he, he gives them authority. And that's something that we saw going all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount, was the authority that Jesus had not only in his teaching, but then uh, through chapter 8 and 9, the authority that he had in the miracles that he performed. Uh, and we're going to see that authority to start being transferred over to the apostles. And that's an important point because Jesus had the authority given to him by God yeah. and you know, empowered by the Holy Spirit and he's preaching with authority, he's healing with authority and not only does he have that authority, even the authority to forgive sins, but he can transfer that authority. Yeah, he can yeah. take that and give it to someone else. Right. And normal people he's able to give that authority yeah. to. And we, we saw in chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 um, or actually through verse 4, he calls these different individuals, his disciples, he gathers them up together here, and he gives them authority, chapter 10, verse 1, over unclean spirits to cast them out and over every kind of sickness. Nick, did you have something you want to bring up by way of review, too? No, I was just thinking about, um, you know, when these individuals are being sent out um, and they're given, given authority, it's important for us to know, it can be kind of maybe a summation of what you just said. You can't give authority you don't have. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we would say that Jesus is, or John would say, that Jesus is God's apostle. And these individuals who are going out, this is like a precursor to what we're going to see in the book of Acts. Um, when they are really sent out uh, to preach the gospel to people. Um, and I think there's some preparation uh, going on here. But also, um, you know, not to jump ahead or anything, um, but the common theme I keep seeing, especially through the end of here, is this idea of, of being uh, worthy. Uh, yeah. I think that's going to kind of play into what we see in the, in the beginning well, verses let's get, there. Let's get into that, but I do want to hang on that, that phrase you said about yeah. you can't give authority unless you have sure. it, or yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. transfer power unless you have power. Right. Jesus has all power, all authority, and now we're going to see how that power works in the lives of his disciples, mm -hmm. which again will point toward the fact that he is the anointed one, he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God. So chapter 10 in verse 5, so he has his 12 disciples together. He's just given them this authority. And here's what Jesus sent out his disciples to do. He says, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this seems to be kind of odd because we one of the points we've been emphasizing over and over is that Matthew doesn't neglect the Gentiles, mm -hmm. but yet here you have Jesus saying, don't go to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. don't go to the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep, notice, of the house of Israel, and tell them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What do you, what do you make of that? Well, I, I think it, it fulfills God's promise, and he goes to the Jews first. Mm -hmm. He goes to Israel first, and, and then it will be opened up to the Gentiles. But he doesn't neglect his people here, the promises that he has to his people uh, because the message is shared among them first. So, so there's an order of operation here. Yeah. We need to go to these people, and then these, and then these. He's not going to ever neglect all of them. What do you think, though, about that, what he's preaching in, in verse 17? And, and two, you know, just to kind of note here, I do think that's interesting, because maybe their natural inclination would be to skip over the house of Israel. Well, they won't listen to us. 
So let's just go to the people who we think will listen. Yeah. Would almost be maybe what they're thinking in, in this context, but the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's got to be a reference to some type of... Um, but I mean, it's the same message. John the Baptist was preaching yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. It came back again. Yeah. But I like what you said about maybe they wanted to preach to a different group. Maybe they would assume, too, that Israel didn't need the message. Maybe on the flip side. Yeah. And here he says, talk to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah, right. So the people there, remember earlier we just read about, it is not those that are sick that need a physician, you know, or uh, not those that are well. <laughs> here you have the sick. Here you have the lost. Jesus says, go to them. God has always cared about Israel, and the fact that Israel is lost, he wants them to get that opportunity to be saved. Yeah, yeah and that's what, it's, it's the bulk of God's people here are yeah. lost. Yeah, and he says, as you go, preach to them, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that, that teaching of the kingdom of heaven is at hand is repeated throughout the book of Matthew. Matthew wants you to see Jesus as king, his kingdom, his rule, his authority, especially that word for authority is royal authority. Right. You know, here, here's king, here's kingdom, you better be part of it. So he tells his disciples to go out there and preach that message. And while they're preaching, verse 8 of Matthew 10, they're to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, all those things that Jesus was doing there to do. Right. Freely you received, freely give. So they received a blessing, and they should also give that blessing too. Then he goes on to a little bit deeper about maybe the practical aspect of ministry. He says, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for a worker is worthy of his support. Well, what do you think he, he's kind of emphasizing here? What stands out to you about what he's telling his disciples? I think, I just want to go back to, you know, because this every time this message is preached, it just fascinates, fascinates me. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And then the next after that, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. Evidence of the yes. kingdom. Right. And so it's like, here you've got this message. Let me show you, let me show you what it really means that the kingdom, let me show you why the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because here's what Jesus is doing when he's preaching. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's healing people, casting out demons, ridding people of diseases. I mean, just doing all sorts. So let me show you that these men have actually been given the power that I've been that I've given to them to preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Which yeah. goes back to his royal authority. It's, yes. It's one right. thing to, to say, I'm giving you this authority. It's another right. thing to back it up and defend right. it. Let them actually right. go out and do it. Well, what I want to emphasize here, though, that seems that he is about to show in these next several verses, I mean, this rest of this chapter, what it truly means to be a citizen of that kingdom. So the yeah. disciples are citizens of that kingdom, and they're trying to bring others to it. And these kingdom citizens that are partakers of it, they're not getting earthly blessings, necessarily. No gold, no yeah. silver. No. Okay, so when you're out no here preaching, could, I mean, they could easily manipulate that situation. They could go out there and heal for money. They could cast out demons for money. I mean, they could have gotten wealthy beyond belief over these abilities. But he says, no, don't get gold, don't get silver, don't fill your pockets or line your money belts or, yeah. you know, your wallet, that kind of idea. He goes, but just take what you need. You know, take a bag for your journey or don't even gather a bag for your journey or two coats or a staff, but the worker is worthy of his support. Don't take all the stuff you don't need, but just understand that God will take care of you. Yeah. Look, I'm not in this to get to gain your to gain people's money. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm in this to do to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the to cleanse uh, the lepers, to cast out the demons. I'm not here to take money from you. No. I think too. You know, I mean, that that's uh, I guess I'm. Sometimes, you know, the opposite of the message that's sometimes preached in America. You know, well, if you, if you do this or you do this good thing or you give this much or you give this amount, then you're going to receive some type of thing. But Jesus' message is the opposite. His message is do it, be, do it because it has been given to you. You receive without paying, give without paying. And they're going to sacrifice along yeah. the way. Now, what he does, though, is he, he makes this statement in verse 10 that the worker is worthy of his support. Sure. And then he's going to explain the type of support the worker is worthy of here. Right. So let's read through this, and then we'll back up and talk about it. He says, And whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it's not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now there's a lot here, but basic step here. So a disciple is going to go into a city, 
and he's going to preach to the people. While he's there, he should look for places to stay and receive, you know, sustenance and benefit and that kind of thing. So there's an expectation that those that are out there doing the Lord's work are going to get taken care of, at least. Um, I mean, I, I know this isn't necessarily a passage so much about our modern day, how we do preachers and ministry sure. full time, but there is an expectation that those doing the Lord's work should be taken care of. Right. We support missionaries, we support preachers, we make sure that they're not starving, right? That kind of thing. Sure. So here, if you go into a house, find a place where the people are worthy and are good people and are trying to support you, give that house a blessing. But if the people there aren't supportive of what you're doing, if they don't want to hear the message, if they don't want to support the message, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet as you leave, kind of as a symbol of I'm moving on, and go on. So, But then in verse 15, the people who don't support the preaching of the gospel, he says, it's going to be pretty bad for you. The judgment that's coming is the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, I just want to point. I want to point this out too. That go back up to verse six, where he says, "Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." Uh, and then again, he says, "In whatever town or village, you find out who is worthy." Right? The the people who are are the lost sheep of Israel, who really are looking for that Messiah, that time, that that uh, the Son of God to come and restore the kingdom, are going to hear that message. The kingdom of God is at hand. They're going to understand what that message is, and that is how. These individuals are going to be taken care of. We know that these people are out here proclaiming the message that's going to change the world. That's going to change the tides of the kingdom. And now we've got uh, to take care of them just like they're, because they're trying to do their work. Not for you know money or for gain, but for the sake of the kingdom of God. I think we need to also plug ourselves into this section. Yeah. We can either be yeah. two people. If, we're, if we are those that are receiving the message, let's make sure we receive sure. it and support it. The preaching of the gospel. Right. If we are the one out there giving the message, the question I have is how do we determine whether or not a house is worthy? How do we know when to shake the dust off your feet? Because I'll tell you, in ministry, I get that question a lot. I get the question, hey Cliff, when do I move on? When do I move on to talking to someone else about Jesus? When do I write someone off? When do you know, kind of similar, when does someone become casting your pearls before swine? I think he's talking specifically here. He's talking about Israelite people. He's talking about Jewish people. So then, how do we plug ourselves into? Is this us talking to our own, our own people, own Christians, or is this um, dealing with people who know nothing, don't want to know anything? I think he, he since he says Jesus. lost sheep of the house of Israel, I think we can make application any time we're talking to people that are lost. Okay. Well, but um, do you have thoughts on this? Well, I was just was thought because I mean, if, if we stay in the context. Is it tied to that, that definition of worthy? Uh, and so if a house is worthy, is that a house that does receive them and does listen to their words? Uh, and if the house is not worthy, that's ones that they do not receive? Is that how he's defining worthy? And see, I, ha I kind of think that the worthy people here are those that are willing to take you in almost. Yeah. yeah. And it's almost like that the hospitable get preferential treatment almost. And I don't mean that in a negative way, like we only like hospitable people, but... Those that are hospitable and kind and, and, and welcoming to those that might be delivering a message from God, those are the people that are going to reap the benefit from it. Sure. And, and I think it, it, it goes back to the end of chapter 9 where, where Jesus tells his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, but he's shown that he is the Lord of the harvest, sending his laborers out into the harvest. The harvest are these lost sheep of Israel. Uh, and, and so you're going to make a, a separation between the wheat and the chaff uh, and to where the wheat would be the worthy folks, um, the ones that do receive you, the ones that bring you in, um, the ones that do listen. And the challenge, I think, for us is when do we, when do we move on? When do we feel like we are wasting our time? And I don't have an easy answer to that question. I just kind of throw it out there. But um, it's a hard one. We never want to lose hope in someone's salvation that they can come to God. I believe in the power of the gospel. I think it's something that we need to definitely be cautious with because we don't know if someone has just a callous heart that has a potential to break and all we're doing is planting the seed um, or are we tilling soil for another seed to be planted yeah um, because I think for us to prematurely cast the dust off our feet on someone um, I mean, 
that could be a, a serious issue yeah. for us. Because we can just write everybody off. Well, they're not worthy of the best. Oh, they shut the door in my face. Uh, right yeah. on. You know, I did door-to-door -door sales uh, in my early adulthood. And one of the things you learned is kind of the don't take no for an answer kind of thing real yeah. quick. And I mean, and you probably dealt with that too. Someone knocks on your door selling you solar panels or vivid alarm system or something like that. You tell them, no, I'm not interested. But do you know that your neighbors are saving this much money? Yeah, but I'm really not interested. Yeah, but do you understand that right now we're offering this promotion? You know what I mean? Let's make sure we're not one and done with people yeah. too. And, and so then maybe the gospel isn't received because of the way that we're communicating. Yeah. Uh, and so are we communicating it differently? Because I mean, if, if, if we go back to the, the lost sheep illustration, there's a lot of different ways to get the sheep back in the corral. Um, whether it's it's your, your dog crawling them around, you crawling them around, throwing feet out there, or grabbing them by a leg and pulling yeah. them in. There, there's a lot of different methods. And so do we rely on uh, the one comfortable way for us to spread the gospel, and we don't look for other creative options or other people to help? Well, well I put a track on someone's windshield, they didn't come to church, or therefore they don't want to hear the gospel. Uh, you know what I mean? kind of like what we talked about a little bit last week, where we... We need to make this transition from a passive Christianity to an active mm -hmm. Christianity, um, to where we need to make spreading the gospel, we need to make going out um, less passive and more active. Oh, I shared I shared your sermon on, on Facebook on Sunday. Check mark. I'm good. I, I did my evangelism for the week. Um, as opposed to going out and actually talking to people yeah. about what was discussed. We're creating well, still share my sermon, though. No, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, we can't just... It's so much more than just one and done. I shared this sermon. I invited that person once. I told them I was a Christian. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. They said no, so they're not Being personal, too. You know, yeah. I, mean, I mean, not just going out and saying, well, I want to make friends just so I can convert people to Jesus. But going out and making friends just because you want to make friends. I mean, I mean, look at the way Jesus lived his life. Of course, Jesus had a mission, but Jesus cared about people. And there's that, that saying, you know, that we all know. You know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, and, and the, this idea of I'm not, I, I don't have an agenda for what I want for your life. I just, I just want to be your friend and I just want to, you know, I want to show you yeah, how. You're genuinely yes, loving and you're real. And your, your life, I mean, we all know this, your life impact, you can impact somebody else's life, you know. And, and, but at the same time, no matter how congenial we are, no matter how genuine we are, there are still some sure. people who want to be our friends who, who want to spend Friday evening with us, who want to have dinner with us, yeah. and do not want to, anything to do with the gospel. And that should be okay. Yeah. That should be fine. You know, we shouldn't have shouldn't have a, an agenda for, you know, we're not selling a product. You know, we're, we're sharing a lifestyle. We're sharing a, a God who showed us grace by sending His Son to the earth. And yeah. when people get that message, when they understand what that means, then it's a lot easier. And of course, I mean, we point out this idea of, of receiving, mm -hmm. right? That they that they didn't that they weren't forcefully, you know, saying, "Here, take it, take my track, Cliff." Yeah. Um, they were receiving, you know, saying, "Hey, I, I I want what you have. Here's what I have," and people took it. And but, it's and, not. But but Jesus here says there's a point where we do move on. Yes. Uh, and so is it limited just to this limited commission of just the apostles? Or is it something that is out Well, let, let's, let's talk about the immediate situation here, and then we'll make it. Because I think sometimes here, we're looking at this through our Western Christianity. Right, 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 right. Everything's peaceful. It's not that hard to share our faith with people. Right after this, he's actually giving them some stern warnings. Because if they go into a city where everybody says, no, you're not welcome here, they might die. Okay? I mean, yeah. so that we need to keep that in the back of our mind. We're, we're kind of framing right. it as, well, they don't really like... Christianity. No, this is a little bit they deeper. Defriended me on Facebook. Yeah, deep, this is yeah. a this is a whole <laughs> other level here of persecution. Okay, well, defriending right. you on Facebook isn't persecution. But notice verse sixteen. He says, "Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Mm -hmm. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as as, as doves." But beware of men. Okay, even before the next part. So he does make it very clear that there are some people out there that are bad guys. Right. That's and good. so let's not. Let's not frame as well, there's just some people that aren't that friendly. No, there's some legitimate people out there that the disciples were going to face that wanted to see them dead. Okay? Yeah. So the message is, be careful because you're like sheep going out in the midst of wolves. And if a sheep is among wolves, they got to be completely careful because that's a dangerous situation. They're gonna eat. Yeah, they're going <laughs> to get eaten. So here's how you do it. Be shrewd as a serpent. 
but innocent as dove. So as you mentioned, be friendly, be loving, be genuine, but also as we're discussing, yeah. keep your guard up a little bit, right. especially when you're in a situation where there's men that are out to get you because your spidey be, sense is on. Yeah, <laughs> you need to. You need to be cautious. Maybe in Visalia, California, we're not dealing with that, but you know what? If I go to Iran and I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, I need to be careful. Yeah. And here he yeah. says, beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. That actually happened to our Christian brothers, okay? They were arrested, they were beaten, they were whipped for their faith. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Now this gets to a whole other level, too. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, so you're going to have a whole bunch of bad stuff happen to you. And by the way, when you do that, that's how you're going to reach the Gentiles. Well, and, yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what, look at Paul. He, he was uh, in arrest in Rome, uh, and that's how he was brought in. And what was it, uh, Felix or I guess? Mm -hmm. not, uh, Felix who said that, um, are you going to, con is, was it Felix who said, you want to convince me to become a Christian? Uh, but regardless, I'm, I'm, it's like I'm, I'm Acts, Acts 26, yeah. um, where, where Paul clearly uh, communicates that message. That, that I'm in chains, I am a prisoner, I'm a political prisoner, but I'm still preaching the gospel. Uh, the, the, the centurion prison guard was converted because they continued to preach while in prison. So what the world is going to see is how we react to the negative response of the world. So if everybody is mad at Christians, want to kill Christians, if we're the ones that are quick to grab arms, if we're the ones quick to riot, if we're the ones quick to revolt, that's not going to make an impact. But... When we're turned over to the kings and we're turned over to the authorities and we are mellow about it, we're peaceful about it, that's going to make an impact. And you're going to be told what to say in that situation. Well, and you could do that and still be um, wise as serpents mm -hmm. and innocent as doves um, to where you, 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 you don't just go running into that scenario. I mean, we, we see uh, through Acts multiple times where uh, the, the early apostles and disciples left the city because of, of how uh, the Jews were coming after him, and they moved on to another town. Yeah. Um, and so you don't have to be actively looking for it. Uh, but if we look at the innocent as doves, um, I, I think we can, again, tie to Paul with his, 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 the message that he shares with Timothy um, and reiterating the way that Timothy needs to be living his life and treating others within the church because right. if we lose that innocence, it can completely discredit the message. Yeah, sure. and, and it'd be the same. It'd be extremely serious here in the first century when you're drugged before governors and kings. In order to bear that witness, to be that testimony, we need to, to make sure that we are and, and do remain innocent as doves. And I almost look at it as the innocent as doves is they're not going to question your motives and the, maybe the shrewdest serpents is more of the you're going to think before you act or speak. Okay. And maybe and, it's maybe it too it's, it goes along the guidelines of, of you know, you didn't do anything wrong to get there. And people understand that you didn't do anything wrong to get before the kings and governors and courts, right? And But you're wise in how you act and respond yeah. and think mm -hmm. and the things that you say to other people. Because a lot of times, you know, think about high pressure, you know, situations. Think about, you know, you're facing death. You know, you're, something bad's going to happen. Our natural reaction is to re respond violently to free ourselves of that situation. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, don't react that way. And, 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 and think about, or do you harshly rebuke that person who is, you know, falsely accusing you? Or do you, you know, take a deep breath and allow, you know, wisdom to prevail? Here he's going to talk about that God's going to actually give you what sure. to say. So let, let's talk about this too. He says, verse um, 20, 19. Um, but when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Mm -hmm. Couple things here. First off, I do believe because these are disciples that are being endowed with a certain level of authority from Jesus to cast out demons and to heal and all that, that they're going to probably have a different level of what they're going to know exactly what to say in the right point. Cliff Sable doesn't always know the right thing to say. They were able to that when that happened, to know the exact line, the exact verse, the exact way of handling it. The exact gesture. Yeah. Exactly. Because it's not just what you say, it's how, how yeah. you speak. Yeah. So it's, it's it's how, it's what, it's when. Um, and, and this is, Jesus is telling them, this is going to happen. It's not an if. It says, for they, uh, verse 17, for they will deliver you over to the courts. Verse 19, when, when they deliver you over. 
Um, and he says it will be given to you. And then in verse 21, again, it says that brother will deliver. brother. All these things are going to happen. So buckle your seatbelts and yeah. get ready. I also think, too, though, that even though we are not going to have the same ability as these disciples, the principle of seeking to speak the will of the Spirit and the Father when we're in these difficult situations is so important. Right. Uh, we need to be praying to God and asking for wisdom. We need more in those situations. We need to be taking a moment to make sure that we're wise as a serpent, as innocent as a dove. These last few weeks, especially even in our country, I've seen a lot of people in places of religious authority or influence mm -hmm. immediately feel like they need to say something. And sometimes they say the wrong thing. Yeah. But those that have been calculated in what they say, not in a political way, but sure. they've thought about it. They've studied about They've prayed. They've sought information. And when they do that, they're able to respond in a way that is is kind, that maybe preaches the truth, and it can kind of solve a lot of issues because they took their time and how they handle it, and God, you know, gave wisdom. Well, and, and to the, the wise ass serpents illustration, um, snakes when when they go after prey, they're silent. Yeah, they, they don't move. They're very calculated mm -hmm. in when they strike, when they take that action, um, and so it's the same with us that. Um, to, to your point, Nick, if we're developing these these genuine friendships with people, uh, we can throw out the gospel, and if yeah. it, if it's shut down, we they maybe back it up a little bit, um, and then work on tilling up that soil before we go and scatter that seed. A little yeah, bit. you don't just bombard people with you know, hey, look, open your Bible. You know, that doesn't really work in this culture, especially in our culture. It doesn't work. Well, because it might not work. Then and either. it might not yeah. work then either. Yeah. But but we can't just walk up to people and say, hey, you want to study the Bible? People are like, huh? What? Are you kidding? Like, study the Bible. Who's You know what I'm saying? That doesn't work, especially, you know, like to the younger generation of kids. They're not as, as aware of what's here as, you know, previous generations. And so it's a lot more difficult to just start here than it would be, you know, with someone of an older gener generation who grew up in a or someone or someone who grew up in a, in a I agree with you culture. but I want us to stay on this yeah, section yeah, right yeah, here. Yeah. No, 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 no. These are people making... that were I mean right. well, there's a lot of we can talk about evangelism in our own yeah. life. But here they are actually going before people who wanted to kill them. Right. And yeah. they're going to be arrested for their and, faith. And these are these are Jewish people too. You know these are these are people who are are well the governors and kings aren't necessarily because well, he says in verse, yeah. in verse 18 you're going to be an example to the Gentiles in sure. too. Uh, right. And then we see this phrase that he brought up on the Sermon on the Mount a couple of times here in verse 19, this do not be anxious. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which we've seen in connection of you of little faith. Um, multiple times when our faith is lacking is when our anxiety climbs. And so mm -hmm. he's reminding the apostles here, do not be anxious. Um, and, and the words you're going to say, have faith that, that, that we will take care of you right. in these times. So he tells them now this, continue to be careful. I don't know if your Bible has a chapter heading, or, but at the top of verse 16, Mike says a hard road before them, and he's laying it out here. Persecution right. yeah. will come. There you go. Verse 21, brother will betray brother to death. It's funny, I've never noticed the to death part till this, you know, today. It just shows but, how strong their yeah. conviction was. You're going to have some, your own family is going to be against you. A father, his child, and children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. So he's telling his disciples, I'm sending you out, and you're probably going to die. Yeah. And they did. Right. They did. And yet they're still supposed to do this. And this isn't the only time he, he no. mentions that. But, but it's to the point where the message that you are spreading will cause division amongst the closest relationships. Yeah. Uh, your brother to brother. And, and, and the division is going to be so strong that they're going to want to put the other one to death. And it's the same with the father and his child. The child will rise up against the parents and want to put them to death because of the message that you are preaching. Mm -hmm. If they buy into this message, it will result in tension strong enough right. to lead to death. He well, says, some of you will believe that the message that's being preached is about the coming kingdom. Some of you will say that's a bunch of malarkey. I'm yeah. not following that. I'm not doing that. I know what's here. I know the when the Messiah is coming. Well, and he's asking for extreme sacrifice. Yeah, sure. yeah. Verse 22, you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. This is like a teaching of revelation right here, okay? I mean, <laughs> this is what is repeated, you know, 60 years later by John in, in his letter, you know, the revelation. James, too. This, and, I mean, the idea that, look, right. 
you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be put to death, and only those who are faithful unto death, those who endure to the end, are those who are going to be saved. Which is really cool to show the, the time and thread throughout the scriptures. Yeah. Because the message is consistent, whether it's Matthew, or, or John, or James, um, or John again. Yeah. And we need to remind ourselves of it. I know that we're not in this exact situation right now, but we might someday. And are we willing yeah. to be hated by all? Are we willing to be hated by our siblings? Are we willing to be hated by our parents? Are we willing to be hated by our children for his namesake? But people might not like me. I might not get paid as a preacher. I might, you know, not be popular online anymore. I might get written off everybody. All, but here, he says, you need to be willing to do that. And now, not even willing. I hate saying that because it makes it like, well, it might not happen. He says, you will. Yeah. It will. will. This was real reality. I mean, historically, I believe the only apostle that didn't die a martyr's death was John, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody else but even he saw it in half, crucified upside down. Yeah, John was exiled on Patmos. I mean, until yeah. he almost died. I mean, so like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he was really old. So, I mean, yeah, it was a hard road ahead of them. Which Jesus says in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, that the way is yeah, hard. Yeah. The way is narrow. It's yeah. not an easy road, but you have to endure. It takes effort. Endurance just doesn't come overnight. It takes effort. It takes practice to build up to have the endurance. And, and I, I mean, imagine yourself, you know, this is someone you've been following for a, a period of time now, and you trust them. And you know that they have power, and you know what they're able to do. And they say, look, I want you to go out and do this stuff. I'm going to give you these awesome things, kind of like hype you up. And then he says, but this is going to happen. You're going to get persecuted. You're going to get flogged. People are going to hate you for what you're saying. Um, you're not going to be, like, you, I'm just repeating what you said. But you're not going to be popular anymore. Yeah. So now it puts it on me. You go, ah, oh, man, do I really I really want to. Well, let's really look at what just happened these last few months with this whole quarantine yeah. thing. All of a sudden, Christianity, as we normally practice, it became a little bit more difficult because we characterize our Christian practices as coming to church on Sunday, Bible class on Wednesday, and doing these activities. All of a sudden, those got shut down. So then it became, if you want to worship, you're going to have to do it on your own. And I know that several didn't. You know what I mean? And even for me as someone, as a church leader, the temptation was to fall out. So all of a sudden, I had to lead my family in, in, in worshiping God and communing and learning and growing. And that became difficult, you know what I mean? Because it wasn't easy anymore. Uh, and then we're away from a brother, and it's so easy to not study, yeah. to not dig I'm in. not being forced anymore. Yeah, I'm exactly. not in a Bible class. He's challenging me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. what, that's the, again, going back to this thought on passive Christianity and active Christianity. Mm -hmm. it, it, you have to put the effort in to stay on that narrow path. Um, I, I think it may not be far too far of a stretch to say if you if I adapt this passive Christianity, I'm going to hear those words on, on that day that depart from me, I never knew you. Uh, we need to grow into that active mentality and, and be aware that it costs, uh, that there, there's, there's a cost to it. Jesus just told um, his other disciples and the scribes that, that I have no place to lay my head down, mm -hmm. that, that leave the dead to bury the dead. There is a cost to this. You have to prioritize yeah. it. Yeah. Do we, do I put the priority on this in life? Or is it just one of those things that I fill in the holes when it's convenient for us? And we always encourage people, you know, to make Christian involvement, church service and stuff a routine, which is a good thing to have. It's good to have a routine of going to church and all that. But if the routine was broken, would we still be as dedicated? See, I mean, and that's a challenge. And if our Christianity is tied up into the formal church worship, yeah. we've missed the boat. Yeah, It's not just a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening or even throw on a Wednesday if you're extra good Christian, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's more than that. It, it's day in, day out. I should be chomping at the bit to get with my brethren uh, any opportunity I can, whether it's over virtually uh, in, in a, on a Facebook or YouTube. I should yeah. be ex extremely thrilled and excited about it. Or if it's True. finally able to get back in a building and worship together, or maybe it's just on a phone call. Maybe it's just in a, a letter that you write to mm -hmm. someone. Um, look yeah. at how they, they communicated to each other in the first century. Paul didn't get a chance to FaceTime his brother. He wrote letters to him, but you can still see the love and the passion that he had for them. And do we have that today? Well, and, you know, you think about, I know we've had these conversations, and every church leader in the world, at least I know in this country, is having these conversations right now that what is the local church going to look like when we're allowed to go back to doing what we were doing before? And, the, and I think about that, and it's almost like, it should be even stronger. I mean, yeah. because yeah. you read most of the New Testament is life's going to be hard. 
The government's going to try to kill you. It's going to be really difficult, but you don't want to be faithful in the death of your seat of Christ. And the first century church thrived during all of that. Yeah. And the church yeah. does thrive. In times of persecution, the church grows because it's hard to be a Christian. In times of persecution, it shows that you must be dedicated yeah. to be a Christian. You must be willing to endure to the end. When this comes, when this happens. Tall, being hated? Yeah. Ooh, that's hard. Yeah. Having my family against me? That's hard. But being yeah. having the government against me, that's hard. But they had to do it. And, and not only they had to do it, but Jesus is getting ready to go right into it that they're not the only ones that go through no. this. No. Now let's keep going. Well, verse 23, he says, But whenever they persecute you, talking about the persecution they're going to receive, uh, when they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. Don't be dumb and allow yourself to die <laughs> if you don't have to. He never says that. You mean, we always glorify martyrdom, and it's good to die for Jesus, but you shouldn't. No one ever says, I'm going to die right now. That's dumb. Okay, he never wanted him to do that. Yeah. So flee to the next. Only Jesus can schedule, you know, when it's going to happen. Okay, right. flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. You're going to have a task to do, mm -hmm. and it's going to keep going, and it's going to keep being difficult till something changes. Now, I kind of texted you guys, you know, today, say, all right, we're going to need to be prepared to talk about what does it mean when the Son of Man comes. The Son of Man is Jesus. We know that, and he's already here. But what does it mean when he comes? What do you think he's talking about, Nick? It's a good question. I, uh, that I need a four-paragraph you know, essay answer. No, yeah, sorry. no, I'm working on that. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, that's a difficult question. If we keep it in context, you know, he's to me it seems like he's talking about what's coming at the end. Uh, so you think the, but, okay. right, so the resurrection. So you're thinking uh, Sunday return. coming is the resurrection yeah, of Jesus? I, I don't know how other else other else to put it unless he's talking about unless he's talking about judgment day. Okay, Nick says either about. resurrection or judgment day. Do you have a theory? Uh, I I go with the judgment day route. because um, I, I think a lot of it's tied up in the, the Son of Man title, which is a title that right. Jesus uses to refer to himself mm -hmm. a lot. Um Wes McAdams actually has a, a podcast, the the Radically Christian Podcast or Bible study podcast. Um, where he goes through a two-part podcast and actually discusses this in depth, in detail, on what it is to be, or why Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. And it goes back to Daniel 7, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the uh, very apocalyptic um, title and that's focused on the ascension. Uh, and that Jesus' is Son of Man is showing that he's human, it's his humanity. Uh, and he chooses to use this title as himself, which shows that when he was on earth, he was uh, our, our God's um, ambassador, mm -hmm. God's uh, uh, representative uh, on earth. So man was able to be exposed to God through Jesus when he was on earth. Mm -hmm. so now that Son of Man, this is kind of, if I understand what you're saying, Son of Man is a term to describe when Jesus is on earth or interacting with the people. He's an advocate yeah. for God. But right? I, I think it, it's more than that. I think it ties to his humanity because yeah. now that he's choosing right. to continue to refer to himself as the Son of Man, he is now still man with God. Right. And so he is able to be man's uh, representative, man's attorney, man's uh, lawyer, man's advocate to True. God. Um, so man has presence with God through yeah. Jesus now, currently. And so with this title, this humanity of Jesus comes, uh, I think it's coming back to that, that final judgment. Okay. I, I don't necessarily think it's final judgment. This is Cliff Saber speculation theory. I had a couple positions. There's other positions out there. One is, is that, well, you're going to keep reaching out to Israel until the church is established, and then the message goes out to the Gentiles too. That's a thought. You know what I mean? Because he's emphasizing you're going to keep focusing on Israel right. until this moment. Yeah. I also wonder if maybe it's looking forward, like Matthew 24, destruction of Jerusalem kind of thing. Could be. That maybe it's. You're going to keep, fo there's going to be a lot of focus on the cities of Israel until though that city is no more, like Jerusalem. But I don't really know. But obviously, when you get to the book of Acts, there's a change of focus into the Gentiles that happens. Uh, and that's, um, but again, this is, a, a, I'm going to defend my position a little bit more. Okay. Uh, this, <laughs> this, is, this is a title that Jesus has used a lot. Yeah. Uh, and if you look in, in Matthew 16, he's talking about the Son of Man will send his angels and they'll gather out his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers. So let's talk about the parable of the weeds. And then in Matthew chapter 19, it talks about the Son of Man um, coming uh, again on that judgment day that, uh, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, um, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. And so, uh, it's again in chapter 19, it's referenced. In 24, you talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, it's referenced quite a bit. 
and then in chapter 26 is referenced again, um, going into this, uh, this time of final judgment. Well, I'll challenge you on the other side here, Please. just for fun. But um, in this section in Matthew 10, back in verse 5, he says, Right now I don't want you going to anybody except Israel. So it seems to be they're only going to go to Israel until the Son of Man comes. If it's final judgment, they can they should only be focused on Israel then. Let's try that out there. You would not have gone through all the towns of Israel. But so he's saying that you're not going to make it through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes? But I think they're only focusing on Israel until the okay, Son of Man comes. Okay, so then uh, I can see that. But I mean, uh, either way, they're focusing on people that aren't going to always receive them. And let's keep that in context, because right. we can argue about this the whole time. It doesn't get us anywhere. The, whether or not we understand exactly what's being talked about in the one line of verse 23 doesn't negate the fact that everything else before this is, it's going to be hard for you to preach the gospel. Sure. So then circling back to your position and defending your position a little bit, is that the kingdom of heaven? Being referenced? I struggle with how Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. Because in chapter 17, he's going to talk about when you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, and then you have the transfiguration. So I don't fully comprehend how Matthew uses kingdom. But let's keep going. Can we we're not. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So verse 24. <laughs> a disciple, and he's still talking to his, his followers, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. If they have called the house of Beel the head, if they called the head of the house of Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the members of his household? He's reminding them that look, if I'm going to suffer, you're going to suffer. Mm -hmm. They don't fully understand all of his suffering yet, but he's going to die. You know, Jesus is going to go to the cross, maybe and he was too. called the head of the right. demons. Too. Maybe that's maybe this is a precursor into what Jesus is going to go through. Too. Oh, I think it is. I'm yeah. going, hey, he's going, hey, look. For, for me preaching this message, this is what's going to happen to me, but it's also going to happen to you too. If they attack the top guy, yeah. they're going to attack the top guy. Yeah, and right. if you're going to so claim to follow sense. me, follow Context. me all the way to where right. we're going. Right. And it's, it's pretty cool because, I mean, uh, Matthew casually throws in the, what the Pharisees said here in chapter 9 about how they cast out demons by the prince yeah. of demons. And then in right. chapter 12, the Pharisees get they even did more that. bold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the, disciples, the apostles here are going to see. They haven't seen it yet, but they're right. going to see... The Pharisees called Jesus, uh, that, that accused him of doing this through the power of Beelzebub. There's going to be a lot of I told you so moments. And then it's, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. So they're, it's, they're going to suffer. If we follow Jesus, and again, we need to remind ourselves that if we're going to follow Jesus, we should assume that suffering is going to happen. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. if, if Jesus suffered, his followers will suffer too. If we're not suffering, maybe we're not following Jesus. Well, let's look at these last few verses. I wish we could go through more, but I know we're kind of pressed for time a little bit because this whole thought continues, but we're going to have to break it up a little bit. Verse 26, therefore do not fear them. Therefore what? Therefore what he just said before. Don't fear those that are... Everyone's going to be persecuting you. They're going to come out to you to kill you, but don't be afraid, right? Because yeah. what is it you always say? When you see a therefore, it talks about the stuff that was immediately pres uh, presided. Well, verse 19, you said don't worry. Yeah. Here he says don't fear them. Don't fear them. Yeah. yeah. This is going to happen, but... It's okay, guys. Endure till the end. So therefore, don't fear. It's going to be okay. Even if you die, heaven awaits, right? Or, or there's nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim it on the housetop. So look, God's going to see everything. He knows everything that's going to happen. And everything you hear, proclaim it. It's not meant to be kept secret. Spread the message of Jesus. Even, even if you're going to die. That's kind of the point. Shout it from the... It's not... Hey, Jesus is the Son of God. It's no, you're telling people. And that's what, I mean, jumping to Acts, you see the boldness yeah. that the apostles spoke with through Acts. Uh, and and they, they had conviction. They had this boldness. They did proclaim it. And do we do the same today? Well, if social media is a good example. If you're afraid to mention Jesus and faith and the Bible on social media because oh, so many people have it, I don't want to have an argument, right. you got a problem with this passage. If you're not afraid to tell your, if you're afraid to point out to your family that you became a believer because you don't want to make Christmas awkward, you got a problem with this passage. If you're not willing to tell your friends and neighbors, you know where you are on Sunday and why you are there and why you don't do the things that they do, you got a problem with this passage right here. But and it it can be a segue into awesome conversations. Oh, absolutely. Too, it's you just say it out. I, we ran, I ran into a buddy at, at uh, getting picking up dinner right before here. And so we started talking about stuff. I said, well, I'm heading to the building to, to record Bible class with Cliff. He, he knows you too. Um, but just able to just throw, slowly throw out those those seeds to see if it takes root. Well, anytime you can name drop me, it's always good. You know, I, I do on a regular basis. I tried it with Nick. 
It doesn't, doesn't have, work it doesn't have the same well. results. Yeah, that happened. So do not fear them. <laughs> it hurts, but, man. It hurts. But he says, verse 28, do not fear. There's that word again. Do not. This sounds like a sermon on do not fear. Do not fear those that kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear men. Fear God. They can only kill you. That's yeah, it. They can only kill you. And that's not bad. The, the fact that they can only kill you is not a big deal. Yeah. And, and that's what... Right, and then it, then it goes to pose the question, do you really trust in God? Yeah. Do you but, really trust in God? Does death really matter? That well, that's much? what he's going to say right here in verse 29. Right. Are not two sparrows sold for a sin, and yet right. not one of them will be fall to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs on your head are numbered, so do not fear you are more valuable than many sparrows. God knows you down to how many hairs, and it's not that many on Curtis's head, but he knows how many are there. And you're more value than, than sparrows, and yet God even knows what happens to the birds. He doesn't want you destroyed. No, and that's what we need to find peace. Oftentimes, we're, we're so uh, we've had this conversation before, where I think the only prayers that we pray are for our physical well-being. Yeah. Uh, instead of embracing, and this is a time of persecution as well. But it, we we fear death, um, and I think the apostles Everybody did too. Does. Jesus is building them up that it's not a big deal. Do not worry about those that are going to kill you. Right. Be focused on God. Fear Him, respect Him, serve Him, and we'll be fine. It's all about shifting their focus, too, because their focus is now. And I, and I think, too, this goes back to what we talked about in persecution. It's not like, now now they've heard all this stuff. Now they're aware and Jesus knows, hey, look, don't don't fear what's going to happen to you in those in those places of, of kings and governors and the flogging. Don't worry about that stuff. That stuff can kill you. But what's more important, what's more important is that you you come to dwell in a place where God is. Yeah. And Jumping ahead here to verse 32. I wanted to do that too. I, 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 I know. Go ahead. Well, Go ahead. no, but um, man, I don't know how far we want to get into this, but then in verse 32, he says, therefore, there's that phrase again. So it's therefore, do not fear them. Therefore, now, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Right before this, he mentioned shouting it from the housetops in verse 27. That's the confession of Jesus, okay? We should be shouting our faith in Jesus, confessing him. And if you're not willing to do that, God's not going to say your name on judgment day. Yeah. Well, and that's what it's, who should we fear? Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And then he immediately ties it to the Father. Right. But Jesus is, is critical here too because um, Jesus is the one that's going to be defending us on that day, advocating mm -hmm. us on that day. To your point, if we advocate for him, he will right. advocate for us. Right, and sometimes we forget. We forget about the soul. We forget yeah. about what lives on. We think about what's here now. Am I healthy? Am I in good shape? You know, do, do I have this and that and these things? So my focus is on what's here Instead of what's up there. And, and what we do here has implications yes. of what happens yes. in eternity. And right. that's what he's trying to remind them here. Right. Look, if you're right. not willing to stand up for the faith now, but, if you're not willing to endure now, if you're not willing to confess me now, if you're going to deny me, I will deny you before my heavenly But father. look at how many times this word fear is repeated in yeah. this passage. I mean, fear is is the, the, the prohibitor here. Fear is what's keeping us from doing what we're supposed to do. Fear is keeping us from... from Acknowledging fear is keeping us from doing all these different things. I mean, and it's look the at natural response, right? And look at look at the amount of fear that we that we've had just in the last three months. Fear after fear after yeah. fear after fear after fear. What do you think that does to a person? Well, it's a tactic used, a natural a natural emotion, right? That's used against us. Mm -hmm. And, and notice too the confession here he mentions right. it's ongoing. Yeah. It's it's active verbiage in, right. in the in the Greek. Right. And it is look, your whole life needs to be one big confession, constantly proclaiming the message of Jesus, even in the face of hardship, even in the face of, as being a sheep in the midst of wolves, sure. even going out there among nations are gonna reject you, even when people hate you, just keep confessing Jesus. So how do we deny him in verse thirty three? What what does that look like? But whoever denies me I will also deny before my father. Uh, what, what, what? I, I think he, more of it here has to do with maybe a verbal thing. Um, I know we could probably say, look, our lifestyle denies Jesus. When we sin, we deny Jesus. And, and those are all the implications of this. But I think it's you have those that are going to, when they're standing before kings and governors, have a big temptation to say, oh, no, 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 I don't follow Jesus. Because they were asked that. You know what I mean? Peter was asked similar to that, and he denied Jesus. 
I think we need to be willing to, even in the face of sure death, okay, that we know we're going to be killed for our faith, still not deny Jesus. Have you ever put yourself in that situation? What if I was in, what if I was being persecuted and somebody said, you know, like, I mean, you ever thought about that? What if somebody was holding a gun to my head and said, you, you know, do you follow Jesus? And you knew that if you said, yes, you follow Jesus, that it was going to kill you. What would you say? I mean, you ever put yourself in that instance? I mean, that's the kind of situation I think we're talking about here is, 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 a, is a split second. You say yes. and What if it was your faith was going to kill your family? Yeah. Yeah. That, see, I think right. that sometimes it's easier to make this hero mindset. If they told me I would still do it. Right. Okay, well, what about for your family? And right. they had to face that, that too. Your wife's head. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the hard yeah. one. And Jesus yeah. here says, you got to be willing to still confess me before men. But whoever denies me, I'm going to deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And, and I want to bring us up, and then we'll close to you. I know a lot of times people grab this verse as a talking about free baptismal confession. This verse has nothing to do with that. This is about you're in the face of, of sure death, and you're going to still. Yeah, because that's what, look at verse 34. Do not think I've come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace. Jesus right. is. Is, I, I know that time's prohibiting us from jumping on, jumping ahead, but he's hitting this hard. Right. He is preparing his apostles. This is our, I mean, our second large speech section about sure. Matthew, and he's spending the entire time on telling the apostles what you need to do when you go out there, right. um, the power that or the power you're going to have, what you need to do, and what to expect in return. Yeah, and, right. and he spends a lot of time building them up, telling them point blank, it's not going to be good, but endure. Stay strong. This is not for your glorification. This is for the glorification of God. Well, let me wrap this up then, and we'll come back to this section again next week, and we'll kind of re-hit some of these high points because it's going to flow into these next verses. But what we've looked at tonight is Jesus has all authority. He's able to give that authority to his disciples, but with great power comes great responsibility. Right there. So they they were to go out there, and they were going to have to preach the message (laughs) of Jesus in front of people that were going to want to kill them. And you know what? They weren't even going to get supported by people. It was going to be hard. But in the midst of of death, in the midst of hatred, in the midst of betrayal, they still must confess Jesus. Because if they don't confess Jesus, God will deny them if they deny Him. Because we shouldn't fear those who are going to kill the body. We should fear the one who can destroy our soul. I thank you for tuning in this evening. Keep sharing the videos online. I know we're meeting back in person on Sunday morning, which is great and awesome. I know it's still kind of awkward and different because we want to go back to doing things the way we normally do it. And we're kind of doing some weird in-between hybrid thing and trying to figure it out. Bear with us. Be patient. But keep sharing the message of Jesus. Keep sharing the book of Matthew. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great evening.